Okay, so I see you can start. So uh, welcome and thank you everyone for attending this uh, new colloquy uh, of the Severo Choa program in the, in the IDA. Uh, today, uh, the, the colloquy today has a very nice title, A Light in the Dark, must is a start word because of the time, I'm sure that the content will be as nice as the, the title. So the, the, same, the colloquy today will be given by Professor Jonathan Tan. Uh, uh, Professor Tan made a PhD at the University of Berkeley in the States. And then he was a Lehman Fellow at Princeton, a Swiggy Fellow at the ETH in Zurich. Uh, then he got a, a position as a professor at the University of Florida. And he is currently a full professor at the University of Virginia in the States, and also a full professor at the Chalmers University in Gothenburg in, in Sweden. Uh, he has a lot of uh, success in adaptive funding, uh, most, uh, more than $60 million uh, in all the projects. And he has uh, more than 200 reference publications, about 200 reference publications with a, a citation list of 45. Uh, he has also been very successful in, in observational proposal with more than observational, more than 40 proposals in Alma, 20 proposals in Sofia, uh, more than 10 at the Hubble Space Telescope, as and many other uh, telescopes around the, the world. So, uh, thank you for accepting the invitation to give this uh, colloquium and for his sessions. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back in Granada. I was just checking, I was here in 2010 for a conference on extreme starbursts, uh, but I haven't been back since. It's, it's a pleasure to be back. And uh, thank you, Ruben, in particular, for hosting uh, me. So I'm going to tell you about work we do on massive star formation, and uh, we've been doing this for more than 20 years now. So there's quite a lot of different things. And over that time, there's been a, quite a large number of students and postdocs, uh, including Ruben, who's who's been working, uh, you know, who's been working with us on the project. Uh, before I begin, I'd just like to advertise the uh, CASM and VICO summer student program that we run uh, in uh, Virginia and in Chalmers uh, every summer. So typically about 20 undergraduate students, some, some master students are, are doing a 10 week uh, research project. Uh, Sam Crow, who, who was working with you guys at uh, this most recent summer, was previously in our program. Uh, so, um, you know, that, that and I'll, I'll point out some of the student projects as we go along. If you have uh, come across uh, good students uh, here in Granada who are interested in such opportunities, uh, point them to our, our web page here. OK, massive stars are important throughout the universe. Uh, as, as you probably know, they explode as supernovae at the end of their lives. and uh, that leads to a lot of mechanical, but also chemical uh, feedback. Uh, I, I have a few pictures here which illustrate contexts of massive star formation. We'll come at the very end of the talk to the, the first stars in the universe, which we think were massive. But how massive is an open question. Then when we see light uh, from galaxies or if you're modeling galaxies, you, you need to understand the radiation and the, and the winds and the, the element enrichment from, from massive stars. Uh, in the, the famous antennae here, these little these, these little dots here are, are clusters of many thousands of, of massive stars and millions of low-mass stars. In our galactic center, we have a swarm of B stars orbiting Sag A star supermassive black hole. In fact, the accretion to the black hole may be dominated by the winds coming out from these B stars. Most stars form in clusters where we, you know, we tend to populate the IMF up to the high end. So in, in the Orion, region with about 38 solar mass to star there that's photo evaporating uh, nearby protoplanetary disks which is shown here so even if you're some planets uh, you have to worry about massive stars being too too close to you it's a complicated problem we are based on gravity but being resisted by various forms of what we can call the pressure support uh, but it can be mainly non-thermal forms or um, you know ram pressure from feedback uh, or you can have magnetic support. Uh, so it's complicated to, to sort of model all of these things, uh, how they interact with each other over this vast range of scales that are involved in star formation. So in, in our group, we typically try and tease out some kind of analytic model or theory for a piece of this. And then we will run numerical simulations to you know, further investigate. Uh, but we do work uh, um, a, a lot with telescopes to test uh, these things. Because once the model is too complicated, you know, you really need to, to test it. And I'll try not to use too much jargon, but 
a core I'll refer to as a self-gravitating uh, gas cloud that collapses to a, a central rotationally supported disk, which would then form either a single star or a small multiple binary by disk fragmentation. That's a core, whereas a clump uh, is typically also a self-gravitating, at least initially, uh, cloud, which will fragment into a population of cores. At least that, that's uh, one way to visualize it, which would then form a, a star cluster, perhaps a bound part or some unbound part. So uh, because of the complexity in, in star formation, particular mass of star formation with many open questions, we don't really know why a particular molecular cloud uh, decides to form stars. You can imagine two extreme scenarios. Um, the, you, you have a cloud sitting around and the internal pressure support uh, decays away. So it could cool, or magnetic fields could diffuse away, and then part of the cloud goes unstable on its own. Uh, or you could imagine a cloud which is compressed uh, by some external agent, perhaps a feedback effect from H2 region or a cloud collision. We particularly like those kinds of models, cloud-cloud collisions, which uh, compress parts of the clouds and, and cause them to uh, cross over into, into gravitational instability. Then the initial conditions, time zero, if you like, of cores or clumps, we want to know how close they are to pressure equilibrium or energy balance virial equilibrium. We'll see that that, in fact, can affect the formation mechanism, this the accretion mechanism. There's been a long debate uh, at the high mass star formation about whether cores are involved at all for high mass stars. Do you have high mass pre-stellar cores is probably one way to, to phrase it, or does most of the mass that accretes to a, an O star, does it join from a, a, a core? So it was initially in, in some kind of, a, you know, some gravitationally bound uh, gas structure that had some identity uh, and had a mass you know, comparable to the eventual mass of the star. That's a core accretion picture, or is it a more chaotic, uh, so-called competitive accretion picture? Um, so here, here's a picture, a classic picture from uh, Frank Xu uh, and his collaborators um, showing core accretion scenario, which is you know, well-developed for low mass stars. We actually now see with ALMA beautiful images of low mass protostars which are forming. There's a lot of symmetry and order. This is, this is a channel map of the, the CO outflows uh, carved out in, in such a core. So it's, it's beautiful to see such uh, structures. Here's a, a disk uh, with fairly nice ordered rotation. So you know what we are actually investigating for high mass star formation is whether such a picture of core creation uh, can apply or how would it need to change. So when we came into this, this is during my PhD thesis, there's, there's a whole range of different uh, discussions of core creation models, including by Myra here uh, in, in her paper in 1999, different kinds of creation rates were um, being discussed, ranging over several orders of magnitude. And so what we with Chris McKee uh, did is basically try and set a boundary condition on the core. And that's the turbulent core model. So cores fragment from, from a clump, and let me go back one step here. In this clump, we imagine it is self-gravitating. So the pressure is the weight of the gas in the clump, but that weight is Newton's G times the mass per unit area, the mass surface density, capital sigma squared. That's the weight in here, like the weight of an atmosphere on a planet, but with no surface. So if the, if the, the clump is self-gravitating, and if it's in, if, if you want to make it in pressure equilibrium, the internal pressure would have to rise up to this value of g sigma squared phi as a constant of order unity. Now, for the we'll see in a second, the typical values of the mass surface density are very high, order one gram per centimeter squared, which means you cannot use thermal pressure at temperatures of order 10, 20 Kelvin. Thermal pressure will be insufficient to support this. Clump. So if, if, you, if you are going to support it, you need non-thermal forms of pressure, which could be basically turbulence, turbulent pressure, or and or magnetic fields before you have feedback. But once your star's in here, then you could have ram pressure from uh, pr protostellar outflows in particular. 
So then from this turbulent magnetized clump, we imagine a population of cores would come into being, perhaps by compression of converging flows in, in the turbulence here. Um, so only a few would be massive, and those massive ones would then uh, collapse for massive stars. In fact, you'd, you'd have a correspondence of the core mass function with the, um, with the initial mass function of stars. So then we just embed this uh, classic cartoon uh, right in here. The point is, in a high pressure region, the boundary condition of the core is such that for a, given, a core of a given mass, it has to be more dense and compressed before it can become unstable. So in a high pressure region, the core starts denser and it will then collapse so roughly on its uh, local freefall time. It will collapse more quickly in a high pressure region. So that the accretion rates of the star will be, uh, you know, depend on this sigma clump environment of the pressure. And the accretion rate is crucial, of course, because it sets all kinds of things, the protostellar structure and evolution, the strength of the outflows, uh, how important feedback would be inside the core. Okay, on the other side here, we have these competitive accretion models, typically have been seen in simulations, starting with Ian Bunnell and, and Matthew Bates' work. They, they started quite simple simulations, only thermal pressure in SPH, globally collapsing clumps. But even in the most recent the Star Forge simulations of Grudich, effectively it's a competitive accretion scenario where most of the mass that ends up in the most, most massive star comes in on the time scale of other, well, comes in from the clump scale and it actually takes quite a long time to get there. So actually relatively low accretion rates because most of the gas is starting from relatively low densities. So for example, it took three and a half million years to form a 55 solar mass star in the Grudich star force simulation and form last in the cluster. So quite different, uh, very different uh, ways, modes of accreting. The closest region is where massive stars are forming is in Orion KL, 400 parsecs away. And this is what the outflow looks like. It looks explosive, nothing like the nice ordered bipolar flows we've seen. So even the most, uh, the nearest example is uh, thought to it perhaps involve some kind of violent interaction. So all three mechanisms may have some relevance and are, are debated still today. So we have these open questions in the time scale, how fast, Clusters form from clumps or stars form from cores. And then how do we get the IMF, but also the multiplicity properties? Uh, so, so many open questions. So here's my outline. Let me go through the, just show you some environments of massive star formation, uh, set the stage. Then we'll look at how we can test core accretion models, the turbulent core model in particular at early and late stages. And then I hope to have time at the end to apply massive star formation theory in the, in the early universe and discuss the relevance to supermassive black holes. Okay, so this is a diagram from our Proto Stars and Planets 6 uh, chapter. It's still relevant because there was, there was no real chapter on star, massive star formation in PP7. So this is, I think, still uh, very relevant. This diagram looks complicated, but it's just the mass of a structure of 10 to 10 million solar masses versus this mass per unit area, the mass surface density in grams per centimeter squared. And as we'll see here, you know, look at this number one here, that's about over one gram per cc or about 4,000 solar masses per parcel squared. And if you look in the top right here, a few equations. So here's how we've, we've linked mass to sigma with a simple spherical projection. Uh, this is that pressure formula that we mentioned before. So Obviously, high signal will be high pressure. And here's pressure written in terms of the interstellar medium, you know, units of, divided by the Boltzmann constant into CGS here, if you prefer these pressure units. And of course, the freefall time depends on the local density. So in fact, we can, we can look at the local densities here. These, these diagonal lines stretching up shallow here are lines of constant volume density. So here's a thousand hydrogens per cubic centimeter or, or a free full time of 1.4 million years. And up here are higher density contours and with shorter free full times. This would be a, a line of constant radius of the clump, one parsec radius, 10 parsecs and so on. And in fact, these lines are, are lines of constant escape speed from the surface, one kilometer a second 
and 10 kilometers a second. That's the sound speed of ionized gas. Okay. Our local galactic disk in the Milky Way is about 10 solar masses per parsec squared. Most molecular, what to see, molecular gas in CO tracer, you need to shield yourself with dust. That requires a certain column density or mass unit area, we like 1.4 magnitudes of visual extinction. But most CO clouds are in giant molecular, most CO gas is in, are in giant molecular clouds, typically about 100 solar masses per parsec squared, somewhere around here, 0.03 grams per cc. You can find 13 CO uh, structures within giant molecular clouds. But star formation is occurring in even denser clumps, star forming clumps traced by HCO plus. This, these are um, these green symbols are millimeter clumps from the Balkan Galactic Plane Survey. And these are red symbols are actually we know massive stars are forming because they often contain ultra compact H2 regions or mazes. And you see they range up to about one gram per cc. So the typical range might be more to this higher place of the environment where massive stars are forming. We can actually put in young clusters that have just formed, like the Orion Nebula Cluster, that's at the half mass radius. This is near the core, near the trapezium stars. This is some global scale. This is a range of densities, and here's 3, and then the other clusters are put at the half mass radius. In fact, some of these most extreme superstar clusters, which don't, we don't really have examples in the Milky Way, uh, may have, well, appear to have mass surface densities approaching 10 grams or even towards 100 grams per cc. Infrared dark clouds are the er are early stages. These are some of the densest uh, clumps within giant molecular clouds. We've studied them a lot. Uh, with extinction mapping, I'll show a few later, but the, the green symbol shows some early stage molecular clouds uh, approaching again one gram per cc. And if I, here's a nice uh, picture. The, the, this was revolutionized by the Spitzer Space Telescope, which could, you know, with roughly two arc second resolution, you see these dark shadows against the, the glowing mid infrared emission of, of the galactic plane. And in fact, you can use that information to, to derive mid infrared extinction maps. Uh, that we did with Mike Butler. Okay, so now let's look at how we could test core accretion. This uh, turbulent core model basically assumes virial and pressure equilibrium at T0 of the core, but it's, it's a virial equilibrium where you also include the surface pressure term of the, of the surrounding clump. And it assumes some, it basically assumes equipartition between large scale magnetic field support and turbulence support. So, it, you know, so that's a parameter. Uh, then it can make predictions for what the structure of this, uh, this uh, core would be. And at the end of the day, if for, for a 60 solar mass initial core, this is one key parameter, the, the initial mass of the core. And this is the clump environment, one gram per cc. A 60 solar mass core would have a size, a radius of about 0.06 parsecs. That's about 12,000 astronomical units. The internal velocity dispersion would be about uh, one kilometer per second in such a structure. And if, if you're interested, the, the, the volume density at the surface would be about 10 to the six hydrogens per cubic centimeter. So we can put uh, gravity and magnetic fields, and heating and cooling into big simulations and actually turbulence and you can have cloud collisions. These are the kinds of structures you can generate from simulations. We, we see if you have strong magnetic fields, you, you get a distribution of, of cores and core masses. Uh, we can also couple astrochemistry. Uh, one key thing that happens at early times is CO freezes out onto dust. So CO is not a good tracer. If you want to find the pre-stellar cores, it's been known from low mass uh, pre-stellar cores in Centaurus that you need, uh, it's good to have deuterated species, species and also species that don't freeze out onto dust. So N2H plus and the deuterated form N2D plus are key tracers. And, and these are, this is what we focused on in this uh, 2021 study uh, with uh, Chi Young Su, who just graduated uh, earlier in the year from uh, Chalmers. And uh, one of our CASM students has been analyzing, you know, do we have uh, mass segregation in, in such a structure? So it's a Maria 
uh, did her, in fact, also a bachelor's thesis in, in Colombia was on this project. Um, depending on what you, you, you start with, typically we actually don't have a lot of primordial mass segregation. Uh, so you can have massive cores fairly isolated, which is different from the, uh, the competitive accretion picture. Okay, so to search for these things, we have to go high into the Atacama Desert. We go to Alma, where we can, you know, as you know, uh, we have a high angular resolution and, and a very sensitive telescope that can search for these uh, faint lines. So we've in, back in cycle zero, cycle one of Alma, we targeted several infrared dark clouds. We're looking for N2 D plus as a key tracer. This was one of some of our first data from this compact configuration, only about one arc second or two arc second resolution even uh, at the time. Uh, but we found strong N two D plus emission, and in the background here in color is this mid infrared extinction map we we derived. And so in regions with, with high, you know, this place you might think there's a core, we've got a good correspondence of this N two D plus emission. In fact, for the brightest ones right at the end here is. Uh, which is a long filament. And of course, of course, with the line emission, you do the Doppler shift and you can get the velocity dispersion. You can test this part here. So we're gonna, that's what we did. We're testing uh, the structure. We can measure this from our extinction map, or if we can use dust emission as well to, to measure this, these masses and mass surface densities, and try and test uh, you know, this, this turbulent core model. And at this point, um, you know, over several cycles, we go to higher resolution. We now have samples of, well, of order, say, 100 such cores, the most, a handful of massive ones. Our most massive one is maybe 50 solar masses that we published in 2018, which we'll see one south. It's shown here. This is the N2D plus emission. Now, nearby are a couple of protostars, but uh, we, with, with Alma's resolution, we can resolve, we can spatially separate out this uh, N2D plus emission. So we think this is, is a separate uh, dynamical entity. Uh, we, have a, we have another example in, in Cloud C here, published this year with Ashley Barnes. Uh, key points here, th these pre-stellar cores are very difficult to find if you use dust continuum because they're so cold. The, the temperatures could be less than 10 Kelvin, it could be perhaps you know, six, six or seven Kelvin. So that's the millimeter continuum map in the top right. It's dominated by the protostars, as you'd expect. But the pre-stellar force is faint in the millimeter continuum, but it's, it's booming bright in the N2D plus. So it, it is hard to find them. Most studies have not been, you know, been typically trying try to find with a continuum, and it's, it's tricky. So we emphasize the use of deuterated species. And then, of course, with deuterated species, you can get a dynamical mass. This is probably the best way to eventually get a core mass, a pre-stellar core mass function in such a regions. Now we have mapped to bigger regions. That was just one pointing. We've mapped across this uh, spine of the IRDC and, and the Northern Spur here. In green is the millimeter continuum dominated by protostellar sources. Blue and red shows 12 CO outflows, many extremely well collimated, as you'd expect in a core accretion uh, type of scenario. And of course, we can estimate core mass function, but really it's a millimeter luminosity function of these cores. And we can compare it to the stellar initial mass functions. And in these units, the salt peter IMF would have an index of 1.35. So we're slightly shallower, but um, we don't have high resolution temperature maps here. So, you know, there's, there's, there can be significant uncertainties. Okay, so now I'd like, I'd say the, the bottom line is we, we certainly have massive pre-stellar core candidates. There are some that exist. And so, you know, we, not many. So we're still, the search continues to, to really build up the population, but there are, there are some. Um, and then early stage cores certainly exist with the, the, the outflows. Now, now let's come on to the, the protostellar phase. So, I should say here, this is the prediction of the accretion rate. It's about a 10 to minus three solar masses per year. This is for a 100 solar mass core now in one gram per cc environment. MC2 is 100 solar mass uh, normalization. Okay. 
Now, a number of groups have actually done simulations of such cores. Here's an example from PIVAS uh, 2011. Now, the outcome depends a lot on how magnetized the core is. Here's quite a weak magnetic field, only 10 microgauss, not much more than the galactic uh, disk average. If this thing fragments a lot, if you put in more like a one milligauss field, which we think is more reasonable for these dense conditions, there's no fragmentation. So we think strong magnetic fields are crucial to have uh, massive star formation, in fact, to prevent the fragmentation. Um, and this is the, the context that we will work with in, in, in our semi-analytic models, which are gonna take this cartoon that's shown in the top right here and just assume a single star forms in the center or at least a single star dominates the radiation. So in this little box here is the grid of models we've developed with each and Zhang, which shows that the range of masses so from 10 solar mass core, initial core to about 500 over this range of mass per unit uh, uh, area, mass surface density from 0.1 grams per cc to about three grams per cc. And we've, we've got a grid of models then, which start at various locations here. And then there's another variable, which is just the evolutionary variable. How much mass has collapsed into the star, M star? M star will grow from you know, zero up to some final mass that forms from the core. We have outflows uh, in here, which so they set the feedback as we'll see in a moment. So we have a, in, the, in the very center of this cartoon, we have a protostellar evolution calculation, stellar structure calculation with an accretion boundary layer. This graph is showing you the size of the star versus M star, the mass. This dotted line is the zero edge made sequence. So stars, the star has deuterium core burning, deuterium shell burning, re rearrangement of the internal structure. At some point though, as a star is growing in mass, its local Kelvin Helmholtz time is becoming shorter and shorter compared to its age. And at some point it, it's, it's gonna be, just because it needs to radiate away energy to support itself, it's gonna contract. So Kelvin Helmholtz contraction will occur while it's still accreting. And it will then you know, reach eventually the zero age main sequence. It could continue accreting. So this is the point where there's hydrogen is fusing in the core here. Now, depending on the environment, so blue is a low surface density region, low pressure, low accretion rates. It takes a long time to, to get over here, a long time. So that means we're, we, you know, it's, it's, we're taking a long time to grow. We, so by this point, we've contracted to the main sequence by about, say, 10, just 10 or 20 solar masses. However, if I go to a high pressure region in red here, three grams per cc, high accretion rates, then I'm racing across here very quickly and I can get over here fast before I contract down and I reach the zero H main sequence of maybe 30 or 40 solar masses. This is important because ionizing feedback will only really turn on when you're, when you're contracted and, and have a hot to photosphere. Okay, so we, anyway, that's at the center of the cartoon here. Then we have, you know, we have an infall envelope, just standard sort of rot with rotation, uh, sort of Ulrich infall envelope. We have an accretion disk, so Shakura Sinaev viscous disk model. We have a, a Blanford and Payne, a disk wind solution from the uh, disk. This is the inner 100 AU here, the density structure. This is a uh, thousand AU scale. Here you now see the infall envelope. This is the 20,000 AU scale. Here's the core, the disk wind. And then we put this into Monte Carlo radio to transfer it to calculate the temperature structure given the power that's coming out from the star, but also the accretion disk. So we can get temperatures, then we can make images, different wavelengths. This is a, a core that is the, um, the, the, the northern outflow cavity is pointing towards you a bit. So it's brighter, at shorter wavelengths. It's scattered light at two microns becomes more optically thin. So by 70 microns, it's more transparent, it's more symmetric. So then of course we can generate, integrate the flux at each wavelength, you get a spectral energy distribution, that's all these curves here, which eventually could be fit uh, to data. And currently work in progress with Prasanta Garai 
all of this uh, streamlined in the infall envelope and the temperature history are coupled to astrochemical models. So we can predict all kinds of different species where the ice lines are in particular uh, inside the infall envelope is the first thing we're, we're looking at. Now that's a semi-analytic model. So we, we do want to do MHD simulations of this structure. So, so here we have a boundary condition set by the turbulent core model. This was, these were simulations run by Jan Naff, who was a former postdoc in our group, tragically passed away earlier this year. Um, you see the evolution. This is star is growing to 24, 25 solar masses here. This is inside a 60 solar mass core. The disk wind becomes more powerful. Basically, it's, its outflow speed is similar to the Keplerian speed at launching radius. That's becoming larger. It's more powerful uh, disk wind later. It opens up and uh, you know, reduces the star formation efficiency at that point. We can do Monte Carlo radiative transfer of these kinds of structures. So this is when it's eight solar masses. This is what we can find in some mid-infrared bands. We can put in CO gas and do line transfer. We can put in a, a, a source of ultraviolet photons and do PDR modeling inside the outflow to predict fine structure lines, for example. We've got a shock ionization model. It's actually very relevant to the radio emission. This was one of the CASM projects from 2022. And we can align grains with magnetic fields and do polarization calculations. So lots of physics is in here that, that we can investigate. So complicated, now we need to test. So we, we go to try and observe some systems. In our group, massive protostars is, is all connected to what we call a SOMA survey. So, so you know, 10 years ago, Sophia was coming online and we decided to try and uh, use it to test uh, some of these models. So as you know, recently retired, but while it was flying, it was a fairly unique uh, facility, getting above a lot of the stratosphere. You could go on the plane, you didn't have to, but I was, well, I try and go, you have to bring your own food. There's, there's no uh, beer or wine. Uh, it's actually quite cold on the plane. In fact, you kind of worryingly, worrying uh, lack of uh, panels. And then I, I look to my left here, that this, this was like 1970s avionics. And this fan, I was told not to touch this fan because it was had a vital role in cooling down this, uh, these avionics, so I was very careful not to touch it. In the back is more sophisticated instruments, which are, you know, the telescopes behind here. We're using forecasts, which can imaging at mid and far infrared wavelengths. And we could, um, you know, basically look at, look at pro massive protostars. So each, each flight we might get, you know, might get one protostar as part of the eight hour flight, maybe just one hour, a few hours on, on the source. So in particular, we were trying to test, um, so, so Sophia forecast can observe up to 37 microns. You're on the beam side of this SED here. And we're gonna test this uh, prediction of, of um, increasing symmetry as you go to longer wavelengths. And the first source we wanted to look at was G35.2N. Jim DeBeiser had studied this from the ground at 11 microns and 18 microns and saw this, uh, what he thought was a mid-infrared jet. And in the radio, the, you know, you have the counter jet. And so we asked uh, Sophia to fly us around. And Hans Sinica was flying at that point. You know? And then, uh, you know, this was the beautiful image it, it took with, with a lot of sensitivity, a lot of dynamic range, four orders of magnitude dynamic range in the image. It had the sensitivity to, to see the counter jet in the mid-infrared. So these images contain a lot of information that can be used to test uh, the core accretion, the model. Here's another one, Cepheus A, shows the same thing. So the, the, the blue shifted side is a, um, of the outflow cavity that is pointing towards us. Short wavelength light escapes more easily. And you know, that's why it looks so different at eight microns uh, compared to 37 microns. Okay, so then, so that was the start of SOMA with G35.2. Uh, this was our, you know, it's grown to be a, a large team, and Ruben has been a key player in the uh, the project. This was our presence at the, the January uh, AAS meeting. Uh, again, many summer student projects. Uh, we have four papers published so far, which have done uh, the, these sources. 
including Ruben's most recent one. And then very soon, uh, the, the clustered uh, protostars will come out with, led by Zoe Telkamp. And as part of this, we, at the same time, we've been developing our methods to automatically find sources, automatically do the aperture photometry, fit the SED models, and derive these three key parameters, sigma clump, M core, M star, as well as two secondary parameters, the viewing angle and the foreground extinction. So it's only five parameters, which is nice to have in, in such a model. So for example, under what conditions do massive stars form? Krumholtz and McKee proposed you need high surf mass surface densities above one gram per cc, so to the right of this red line, to have massive stars at all. Uh, that was to prevent fragmentation by thermal heating of low, surrounding low mass, uh, high luminosity accreting low mass stars. But we find lots of massive protostars to the left of that line. So we don't think this model is relevant to basically because we, we can use magnetic fields to stop fragmentation. We do notice a trend that the most massive protostars do tend to be in high sigma uh, regions. We think that's more consistent with an internal feedback model that we developed with Kei Tanaka. Basically, in high surface density clumps, the core is denser at the beginning, and so it, it can actually form with, with more efficiency to the, to the star due to this outflow feedback. So for, but if I'm in a 1.1 gram per cc environment, like uh, here's a 100 solar mass core, it only forms a 20 solar mass star. It's, it's relatively weakly bound and, and the outflows can push stuff away. So this is probably part of the story of, of why we have this uh, hint of a, a trend at the top here. Okay, so, uh, so SOMA was uh, Sophia forecast. SOMA plus, if you like, is, is our follow-up. I mean, we, so, so far we've, we've um, well, there's archival data. Sankra worked on this, in fact, a lot in the Galactic Center. We have other regions look, we're looking at. The image information, the images carry information. So we can do image fitting rather than SED fitting. We follow them all up in the radio. Uh, so in particular with VLA for most of them and ATCA for the Southern sources. Uh, Viviana Rosero leads the solar radio uh, survey. That's one main goal is to break infrared SED degeneracies. So here's the infrared SED. Different models could actually fit this, but they make quite different predictions for photoionization in the radio because the ionizing flux depends, you know, grows a lot as M star grows. So here's a model of CFPSA where we prefer this, so this model here in gray here, which is the 12 solar mass. Okay, so yeah, 24 would be ruled out in the radio, but not so easy to rule out in, in this infrared SED. And it's, you know, we, we, so we like this, this angle R, the diagram that we, we plot here, radial luminosity versus bolometric. Uh, we're putting our solar sources, these are the first eight here, these are low mass, we think shock ionized, which follow power law relation. At some point, photoionization will kick in here. That's this, these blue mock lines uh, for, for a model. And this is, uh, these are not published yet, but these are, we, this is SOMA radio, you know, one, two, three, and four, all the data we have here, uh, trying to populate uh, this, this range. Then there's many other things. ALMA follow-up in particular has been very important. Uh, we've done a number of the sources uh, and, it, and Ruben in particular has been working on the infrared, near infrared uh, follow-up uh, with HST and LBT. So I, I don't have time to show many things, but we have some examples of what we call isolated uh, massive protostars. This is isolated from the point of view of ALMA continuum sources. It's see, once you get away from the, the central core, this is in G28.2, within a scale of about a parsec across, there's very little seen in ALMA millimeter continuum. So it's not surrounded by a cluster uh, for, for, of ALMA sources. Uh, but it's a 40 solar mass protostar in here, either with a dynamical mass or SED fitted mass, there's a broad CO bipolar flow. Then this is what Sam was working on here in Granada this uh, summer, AFGL 5180. This is LBTAO image, uh, which you see the, the bipolar cone here, one side of the cone. But in particular, we can also try and look for low mass YSOs around the uh, protostar. Is there a cluster? And how many stars are around there? So we're sensitive down to about 0.1 solar mass YSOs, 
the black symbols are the radial profile of the projected number density um, shown in black here. And he, you know, he, here's a star forged competitive accretion model in red, has this fairly steep profile. It's, it's actually quite, quite good for, for this data. Um, these pink lines are actually a simple protocluster model where stars form independently. Uh, so, but we can also, we can also make it with a protocluster model. So this is early early days, but once we have more data, we'll, we should be able to distinguish uh, the different models. Then James Webb. We have several regions. What one done in cycle one, and a few more coming in cycle two. Uh, this is in the outer galaxy, actually a low metallicity region. Um, what we notice here is we, we have the bow shocks on each side. This is about a parsec across, a few parsecs across. We see the infrared cone right in the center of, of the, the protostar. There's a high degree of symmetry in the system, which tells us that over the accretion history, it, it's held its orientation. I mean, there's a slight bend here that I, I could rectify and have a perfect symmetry if, I'm, if I just have a little drift of about so two kilometers a second. So this is another example of what we'd say ordered massive star formation, even though there is a, a, a small cluster around the, the source. So in conclusion on, on you know, I think we're making quantitative tests of core accretion models and, uh, you know, th they seem relevant to explain some of the things we're seeing, many of the things we're seeing. Okay, let me, let me now in the last few minutes just to tell you what we're doing in the high redshift universe. This is a sub. This is a project in the group uh, that has expanded a lot recently because we we're very excited by it. Actually, uh, population three point one protostars. The basic question we're trying to answer is where do supermassive black holes come from? As you know, they sit in the centers of most large galaxies. We can even see the event horizon shadow. Most uh, large galaxies, so roughly every one third L star galaxy and above has a supermassive black hole in its nucleus. And that tells us roughly the co-moving number density of these things is at this level of order, you know, somewhere in this range, somewhere in the middle here, we think it could be one per thousand cubic megaparsecs or one per a hundred cubic megaparsecs, depending on where we, we draw the line here, this uh, seeding. So where do they come from? Uh, it's a big open question. We think we're going to have to go back early uh, to explain them, and that, that's mainly driven by the fact that, you know, for a long time we've known there, there exist very massive high redshift quasars. So this was pre-James Webb era. We had examples of sort of billion solar mass black holes at very high redshifts, uh, only about 700 mega years after the Big Bang. Now James Webb is finding more. This is redshift 10 here, somewhat lower mass, but still. Uh, this tells us the initial seed mass was probably quite massive. The, the growth could be Eddington limited. We might expect that for, for, for the growth of black holes. So this, this graph here shows you tracks of um, back in time, in some known high redshift quasars, how massive the thing would be going out to you know, redshift 30 here. So if you want to form you know, around redshift 20, your initial seed mass would be more than 10 to the 5 solar masses. Now, in, in many simulations, because we don't really know how to form things, they do a very simple model known as uh, say a mass threshold model. So in illustrious, for example, when a, when a dark matter halo mass exceeds 7 times 10 to the 10 solar masses, they just insert the seed, and they typically put in a massive seed. Uh, but there's no real physics in that. Um, you know, things are improving a little bit, but it's still very simple models with a density threshold or... Uh, or, um, you know, but no, no, no real uh, good physical model. So if you actually try and understand where they might come from, you, you might want to first look at say, the, the first stars to form, so-called population three uh, stars. This was studied in numerical simulations going back 20 years or more. Two main groups first, Volker Braun and Thomas Bell's uh, led studies where they saw first structures forming in so-called dark matter mini halos. These are million solar mass dark matter halos. You, you need this kind of mass to have a deep enough potential to allow baryons to cool. The cooling is through H2 uh, row vibrational transitions that can cool the gas to about 200 Kelvin. 
and the gas slowly cools. So you have a little bit of H2 molecules formed in the gas phase, uh, catalyzed by um, free electrons. And so that this was seen in simulations. We, we put this cartoon in the center of this thing with a, a boundary condition of the accretion rate. We, we followed the protostellar evolution, just as we've seen before. When do we reach the main sequence? When does ionizing feedback kick in? It's around 100 solar masses. And this was later confirmed by uh, you know, radiation hydro simulations. So 100 solar mass stars cannot, cannot make a supermassive black hole. These would be light, uh, relatively light seed black holes. So most attention in the field is focused on direct collapse mechanism, which is, is explained here. You need a more, much more massive dark matter halo, so something like 10 to the 8 solar masses. You, you've got to stop it fragmenting, so it's got to be metal-free and dust-free to stop the, the cooling, but you've also got to stop the, that H2 from forming in the gas phase, so you need to irradiate it with a certain intensity from surrounding sources, but then you need to know the IMF or what these things are. So this has become very complicated and uncertain to calculate. Still, some, some groups have tried to do this, from Chon, for example, they only find a couple of such uh, direct collapse systems in their 20 megaparsec box. So they have an estimate here. In the more recent uh, WISE study in nature, they have an even much lower value. And if you remember, if we want to make all the supermassive black holes, we are orders of magnitude are too low here. So direct collapse maybe can make a few, but struggles to make all the black holes. So in my, I, I know I'm running out of time here, but my last uh, a uh, couple of slides here. We we propose we, we've gone back to population three stars, and we, we, we want to look at them again. And the idea is um, that there may be special uh, population three stars, so called three point ones. These are the, the first stars to form locally in their region. So here's a three point one that first collapses. It will affect things around it by its radiation, and we'll see that that radiation, or has been seen that this radiation can actually affect the outcome. So in fact, ir irradiated mini halos tend to fragment more and make lower mass, maybe 10 solar mass stars. And depending on metal enrichment, you can start making some population too. The key point is over here, we are far enough away that this has not been significantly affected. And this will also be a 3.1, an undisturbed uh, first star. Now, why do I care about these undisturbed first stars? Because I'm interested in how we could have these stars grow to supermassive scales. How do I stop this collapse to the main sequence and the ionizing uh, feedback? Well, it is a proposed physical mechanism which could operate inside population 3.1 sources if dark matter self-annihilates and produces uh, electron positron pairs and photons, which are trapped in the protostar. That's a power source, which changes the stellar structure. And that's been looked at by us and by, other, by one other group, Srindh Ladala study in 2015, where you can, you can stop the protostar reaching the main sequence with this wimp annihilation heating. And there's a solution which allows the protostar to stay large and if it's large, it's cool and doesn't have UV photons. And so the baryonic content of the mini halo could efficiently collapse to the center. And that's about 10 to the five solar masses of baryons in the mini halo. So we're particularly interested in this mechanism of POP 3.1 star formation to produce the black holes. So we've embedded that physics of 3.1 definition here with an isolation distance parameter into cosmological volume uh, simulations to estimate the number density of these uh, these seeds. So here's a, a universe evolving from high redshift, redshift 40, down to redshift 10. This point should be redshift zero. This is the co-moving number density locally. We think of supermassive black holes. This is how many we, we need to make. If the isolation distance is very large, so that a 3.1 needs to be 300 kiloparsecs proper distance from any other source, then I would, not, I would not be able to make so many, okay? As I make this isolation criterion smaller and smaller, it's easier to have a pop 3.1 source, I can make more and more. 
about 100 kiloparsecs proper distance is what is needed to match this, this number density. I could go higher and later merge them, but I need at least this. And they're all formed by ratio 25 or 30. That's like three megaparsecs co-moving. So this, uh, this is the ratio 30. Chad Beer, uh, who's a PhD student with us at Trieste, has extended these down to ratio zero. So now we have the full range. And here's that illustrious type model where they only put in seeds in massive halos, seven times 10 to the 10. So they don't have these until lower redshifts, of course. So all our black holes are in place at, at high redshift. And now to test the model, we would need to find black holes at high redshift. So that's, the, that's what we're very interested to do now. So I, I was giving this presentation in 2019 in, in Stockholm at the Astronomy Day thing. I had like a 10 minute talk, but Matt Hayes was there and got very excited. We were in the bar afterwards. We got very excited and we thought, well, how are we gonna do this? We should go to the Hubble ultra deep field. And that's a nice, yeah, that's the deepest place. And we should try and find AGN in the ultra deep field. And the way to do it would be, um, as we'll see through variability. So we started making predictions. This, these are our POP 3.1 models, different DISOs, at different redshift ranges, five to six, six to seven. We have a constant co-moving number density. So we have a fairly constant number of seeds, at different redshifts here, whereas the mass threshold model would, they would soon run out. So we, yes, if you go back and reobserve the ultra deep field, you could potentially find AGN by variability. So we wrote the proposal in 2020, it was rejected. 2021, it was rejected. But in 2022, finally, it was accepted. And so, and in August this year, we reobserved the ultra deep field with another 30 orbits in F140W. So we can compare. This is the comparison epoch one back in 2012. So we have, in fact, we I can't. I don't want to quantitatively show you the results, but we have, we have a number of variability candidates at high redshift. And we can now begin to test this model. Of course, in the meantime, James Webb has come along. There, there are already sent different ways of finding AGN. There's a couple of studies which are already finding quite large numbers of AGN out here. In fact, it's, it's a very exciting time in the field. There's an unexpectedly large number of AGN out there. Um, very massive compared to the galaxies. So we, we think it's a very promising for this model. So here's a quick summary of the supermassive black holes. There's a, it's a big problem. Where do they come from? Uh, direct collapse struggles to make all of them. We like our population 3.1 model, which involves new physics. You know, it's pretty important. Uh, we require a power source from WIMPs to annihilate in the star. To, to allow us to reach supermassive scales. And there's lots of predictions, gravitational waves, clustering of AGN. So if, if you're interested in that, please come and talk to me. And here's a, my overall summary. We're trying to develop a general theoretical model of massive star formation uh, in the context of this turbulent core model. Um, we're testing the early stages by looking for massive pre-stellar cores with deuterated species with ALMA in particular, and for later stages, a whole host of things going on, testing the emission that comes out from such a structure uh, with infrared observations and, and submillimeter observations. And now applying this in the early universe, there is a way to make supermassive stars, uh, but only in special locations where you have a star co-located with a dark matter cusp. And that only happens in these first POP3 uh, mini halos. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jonathan. So if anybody has any questions, please raise your hand. Um, yeah. Perhaps I can start. Uh, but well, if, if there's anything online, please let me know. But uh, uh, I was wondering actually how would you, this is actually a question that I have for some time, how would you confront a pre stellar core? How would you observationally say, okay, this press candidate is a press Right, well, you, it's, 
you know, it's going to be very challenging to, you know, you could have a very low mass source in there. So in some sense, we will never be able, there'll always be a limit. Mm -hmm. um, but we look for things that are highly deuterated, which suggests that they're cold. Um, but early stage protostellar cores could still remain highly mm -hmm. deuterated. Um, we look for the presence of outflow activities. We look for a concentrated millimeter source, you know, uh, and we'll, we'll always have some, some uh, sensitivity to that concentrated millimeter source. Uh, it's probably the, the main way uh, we'll be looking for things. Thank you. Any questions in the audience? Thank you for this excellent talk. And um, I have a curiosity about your last model, which I found very exciting. It, 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 physically, which is the, the meaning of this uh, distance or scale parameter you, you mentioned? Right. That's a great question. The isolation distance. The well, isolation what? parameter. Yes, a physical model for the isolation. Well, you could think of the stronger and sphere. You could think of the, um, this, let's say there's a supermassive star as the precursor. Let's say my star reached about 100,000 solar masses and was on the main sequence, in fact, for a while before collapsing to a black hole. You can estimate um, the ionizing photon output of such a star. So a, a normal O star is 10 to the 49 ionizing photons per second. Such a star would actually have 10 to the 53 ionizing photons per second. The stronger and sphere in the intergalactic medium density of redshift 30 of a 10 to the 53 photon per second source is about um, 60 kiloparsecs proper. So there's a, an example of physical model. In fact, we've done calculations with stronger and spheres as the model. I personally think it, it, you know, we also have to consider the, um, it takes time to fill the stronger and sphere. So we actually have to work at R type expansion. It's a bit smaller, but the FUV field in front is also, we think important for, you know, Lyman Werner for dissociating the H2. That is the order that of mine need to. But, uh, you know, a stronger model would actually not be too bad. And, and also, you show uh, a map of uh, massive star forming region. Uh, you were, I remember you know, the scale was 40 seconds or so. And, and there were a lot of nice bipolar flows. Mm -hmm. and, and, and one, several of them were uh, very well collimated, which is not very usual in massive star forming, in, 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 for a massive star. So, do you think all these uh, outflows uh, come from massive stars or there is a mixture of mm -hmm. massive and, and smaller mass? Yes. Uh, well, that was the image of the infrared dark cloud, which is um, quite far back. But um, yeah, no, not all of those will be massive but protostars. We, we don't quite know what they're going to be, um, but not, not all the cores initially, now, uh, but as, as we see them now, are massive. Um, but some of them are, so, and that they're all mostly collimated. So I, I think that's an important piece of information. Uh, when we look in the SOMA server, we follow up with ALMA, you know, we often see collimated outflows as well. Uh, we have some wide angle ones, but still generally bipolar. Now, as you know, Orion KL is, is not like this, and there are a handful of systems which are, uh, are somewhat different, but we think they're the minority. And, um, did you have make an, an association of the luminosity or, or the mass or estimated mass or the star and the outflow? So yes, we're beginning to correlate the volumetric luminosity or, or estimate of M star with all of these quantities to, to really you know fill out the evolutionary sequence of different metrics. And, and, and you see some change in the collimation according to that has not been measured. Uh, I have the feeling that massive stars are. Yeah not well collimated in, in general as are right. the low mass. We, we've not quantified that yet, but we have some examples uh, anecdotally where I showed a 40 solar mass quite isolated one. It has quite a wide angle a cavity. Once you have a wide angle and, you, and you're willing to have the orientation in different ways, then the CO morphology can look quite complicated. You know, in our 23 paper, we've done some synthetic images and, and you, it looks quite uh, complicated, when, even though you have a bipolar flow with a wide angle uh, and there can be substructure in the, in the outflow, of course, it, it can look uh, a little strange. Uh, and then you alma filter it, it can look, uh, but we have some examples I can show you. Okay, is there a I have so several questions, thank you very much for the nice review about massive protostars in different contexts. 
Uh, the first question is regarding the simulation. Uh, it seems to me that you mentioned that the magnetic field in the uh, filamentary structure, large scale clouds, is about hundreds of microgauss. Can these or could these simulations predict the magnetic field in the collapsed envelope and in the final protostar, for, in, for instance, in the disk or not? Uh, yes, we can predict uh, things, but uh, right now I'm not sure how good they will be because um, probably we, we need um, we need some non-ideal MHD processes. Um, we have done some models with ampolar diffusion, but um, that that is sensitive to the chemistry and the ionization state. Um, as you know, when you form a star, you've got to lose most of the, you know, 99.9% of the magnetic flux. Uh, and, and predicting that is very challenging. Even to make the disk is challenging. So um, we are heading in that direction. There are other groups, you know, Hannibal and Thomason's group in particular are doing some nice work in that direction as well. But it's hard to predict. Uh, it could be reconnection diffusion of the field. And resolving that in the simulation is challenging. Well, the second question is regarding the, the spectral energy distribution modeling. Uh, how do you include the, this in these pro massive protostars? And um, if you include them with properties of the disk, can you derive uh, from the spectral? Right. We do include the disk. Um, we make an assumption, which I didn't mention. We assume the disk is one third of the stellar mass. So mm -hmm. the disk includes M, quite a massive disk then. Um, we think that would be, there's a physical reason for that. It, we think it would be self-limited, but you know, once you become too massive, it's you know, spiral arms and gravitational instability, which would then enhance accretion. We also assume uh, this initial angular momentum of the core is about 2%. In fact, that should really be another parameter. 2% uh, is empirically measured in by uh, Alyssa Goodman and others in samples of cores, but that, that could vary. That sets an outer disk scale in the Ulrich model. Um, so so our, our disk size is a fraction of our initial core size. So again, in, in high pressure regions, cores are smaller, disks are smaller, uh, and that, that's in there. But really, there could be a variety of disk sizes. Uh, yeah. Can you predict the mass accretion rate? The mass accretion rate is a part of the model because it's uh, it's controlled by the collapse solution. So the disk is fed with this accretion rate, and we assume it is processed through the disk. Uh, and we, we have an alpha viscosity in the disk, so that, that sets the disk structure. But we remember we've set the disk mass to be one third of m star. Uh, we have all the opacities. We also have gas opacities inside the dust destruction front. So we have uh, that. We think that's under control for the SED. What we don't have is, for example, CO bandhead emission from a disk atmosphere. But we would like to add that in. And the final question sure. I'd like to have the opportunity to ask you uh, which is the more favorable scenario to form as you start? You had mentioned in the first slide previous scenario, the growth yeah. scenario. The competitive accretion and the collisions. Right. What are you talking about these three possibilities? What do you favor? Well, the one I favor, I may be slightly biased, but, you know, we're working on core accretion for a while, but uh, we do see uh, collimated outflows. And uh, this last James Webb image I showed, which has, uh, you know, the bow shocks uh, fairly, you know, well aligned with each other on opposite sides tells us that um, it's held its orientation you know, in a stable way for, for its accretion history. So that, that is an interesting uh, thing. And then we have examples of massive protostars which don't seem to form around a cluster, you know, with a cluster surrounding them. And that, that again, uh, effectively rules out competitive accretion in such a cases. Is there any other questions in the, in the room? In the Zoom, is there anything? Okay, before we say thank you to Jonathan, I would like to make an announcement is that tomorrow, I mean, Jonathan will be with us um, today. So in the afternoon, if you want to talk to him, just shoot me an email or to him. And um, tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock, we will be another informal seminar about planet formation. You know, so we go from primordial stars, star formation up, and also about planet formation. So those of you that are interested will be at 11 o'clock in the Sala de Futa. Uh, it will be more uh, like a discussion environment, more informal. So he will set the stage for about 20, 30 minutes, and then everybody will 
be encouraged to, to chip in with ideas like that. But with a further deal, let's thank you again, Jonathan. Thank you very much. I'm going to be going now for lunch here nearby. So if anybody wants to join, yeah.